Yes, exactly. Okay, okay so let's, let's do it that way. Okay, so I'll start sharing my screen here. Okay, can everybody see this? Yeah, we can see it. Yes, okay, yes. Cool. awesome. Okay, so I apologize again for <clears throat> the misunderstanding for time. Uh, my name is Maria Watson. I am the Sea Turtle Aquarist here at Sea Turtle Inc. And we also have our Chief, uh, Chief Conservation Officer, uh, Dr. Amy Bonka here with us as well. And she can help us answer questions at the end. So we'll go ahead and get started. So just to go over like a little bit about what we'll be talking about today, um, we'll go over our mission here at Sea Turtle Inc., um, what life support systems are and why they're important, um, our hospital and resident sides of the life support systems that support those, and then our day-to-day -day routines with them. And then we'll touch on the Cold Sun event that happened back in February, what went wrong during that event and what we learned from it um according to our facility and then the future renovations that we have um in our future plans for moving forward okay so it's here at sea turtle inc our mission is three tiered our first tier is education so just like we're doing now we love to educate the public about what we do here with the sea turtles and how we help rescue rehabilitate them and release them back to the wild we also focus on conservation, especially with the Kemp's release species. They are the most critically endangered species of all of the sea turtles. And we focus a lot on that because they nest here in Mexico as well as South Padre Island, Texas. So that is very important. And that's a lot of what Dr. Uh, Banca does as well. So this is a basic rundown of what life support systems are created of. Life support systems are the backbone of any tank or aquarium setting. So it's basically the heart and blood of <laughs> what makes it go. So they are comprised of pumps, filters, anything like sand filters, cartridges, or carbon. Most of what we have are sand filters. We'll touch on why in a minute. Uh, we have protein skimmers and fractionators. They're the same thing. Um, we'll touch on what they do as well. Uh, UV sterilizers the tanks themselves, the plumbing that goes with it, and heater chillers and heat exchangers. So those are a list of things that we have here at our facility. I'll touch on how we use them. Um, but of course, there are several other different pieces of equipment that other aquariums could be using as well. So before we go into the different types, there are three different types of filtration. These are all super important to understand before we go into the actual pieces of equipment. So. The first type of filtration is mechanical filtration, um, and this helps trap waste that comes from, and it actually is coming from the animals that are inside the tank. So either your fish or your sea turtles like we have here, we have both, especially in our uh, resident side. So all of that waste that they produce from just going to the bathroom or food waste that they don't consume or just sloughs off over time um, it can really muck up the water so we want to make sure that we're providing a really healthy environment for these animals to live in so uh, mechanical filtration just helps improve water clarity over time so that's stuff like filter socks or sand filters um, and then i'll mention as we go into the pieces of equipment which types of filtration that they actually are the second type of filtration is chemical filtration it uses a chemical process to remove different toxins and harmful substances, um, especially like nitrogen compounds from fish and other species uh, from the water. So things like that, that will be able to help us get those um, harmful substances out are protein skimmers, UV sterilizers, and activated carbon canisters. We don't have those on site, but that would be something cool for the future to have. And then lastly is the biological filtration. This can occur in any part of the tank that remains wet. So this is all of your bacteria, your really good bacteria. So you have harmful bacteria and good bacteria. All of it is part of the nitrification process. And a lot of that comes from just waste of the animals. So over time, if there are not water changes done, um, your ammonia and your nitrites and nitrates can all spike. And you don't want that because you want to have a healthy environment for these animals to live in. 
Um, but you do want good bacteria in your system too, to keep an even and equal balance. So uh, this beneficial bacteria can be found in the sand filters, as I had mentioned, um, bio balls, which are just little tiny balls that you can put in bags to keep in the tank. And then you can actually take those out and put them in a new tank to start up and start cycling that to create a brand new one. Um, and then the exhibit substrate. So any kind of sand or crushed coral that's found at the bottom of your tank, um, all of that beneficial bacteria can be found there too. Okay, so first we're gonna start with the sand filters. These are great pieces of equipment that can filter out solid wastes from the tank. So they have different types of media in them. Ours have uh, sand and they vary in size for the sand inside the filter. And what it does is it has the water flow through our multi-port here, which is connected to every sand filter. It brings the water through it up and out. Can you guys see my, my mouse, by the way? Yes, we okay. can. Yes. Great, wonderful. So you're gonna have your incoming water from your tank, which is the red here. It's going to be brought up and out into the sand. It's gonna be filtered through. And what it's doing is it's trapping any big particles or even smaller particles of waste. So if you have algae in your tank or you have other waste products like we were talking about, it can get trapped in there. And that's really good because then once it's filtered, that water, that cleaner water will be returned back, pushed back up and returned back to your pool. So. Um, and we'll talk about maintenancing it in a little bit here. We backwash or waste the water from the sand filter and it helps fluff up the sand and it helps reduce channeling. So once your water is going into your sand filter and it's going 24 seven, um, it can create channels. So like little pockets um, inside the sand and you don't want that because over time it won't be going through all of the sand. So in order to prevent that, we can backwash it and it takes all the particles out of the sand, it washes the water back in a different way. That way it can um, break up those particles and wash them down the drain. That way they're not in your sand filter anymore. So this type of filtration that this is, is a biological because it has the beneficial bacteria as well as mechanical. So the sand filter multi-port, uh, like I said, each sand filter has one. They have different functions. Um, we use basically every single one of them except for the recirculation. So the filter setting, you just change the valve right here, whatever you, setting you want it on. It usually remains on filter for our systems at least uh, in almost 24 hours a day, unless I'm doing a water change. But the filter setting helps, um, like I said, keep the smart particulates that are coming from the water um, going through that sand. So it's constantly being filtered. If I need to do a backwash or I need to do a water change on this system, I can simply turn off my pump, change a few valves, and then change the valve on the multi-port to backwash. And it helps push the flow of the water to do what um, I'm needing it to do. So all of the, the waste will be washed down the drain, which is pretty cool. The rinse cycle is super important. So after you backwash, you always have to put it on rinse. That way the sand can settle down to its original state before you bring the filter back online to the filter setting. Wasting is pretty much the same thing. It has the water going the same direction as it is in filter, but instead of backwashing and fluffing up the sand like we talked about, it's just pushing the water directly out. Um, recirculation essentially just bypasses the filter altogether. So if you are going to maintenance your filter, a lot of times um, you don't want your filter to be offline for a long period of time. So you can actually set it on that. That way it's still going, but you can still access your, your filter without um, causing harm uh, to yourself or the actual system. And then closed, that just means that the water flow stops altogether. Um, and that can also be a good tool to use when you need to maintenance your pump or uh, your sand filter too. So a UV sterilizer um, is a chemical type of filtration. And this is just a UV light that is used to kill off parasites and bacteria and viruses um, and things that other things that are found in the water. And this is pretty cool. So we actually have, um, I'll show you guys in the next few slides. On our hospital side, we have them on our FP tanks. So FP is fibropapilloma virus and it is a herpes virus found in sea turtles specifically and just like the herpes virus it can be very contagious so it causes these 
nasty tumors on them, which create all kinds of problems for them. It can go over their eyes or prevent them from swimming. Um, and so what they do is on the system by having these, it can kind of help control or at least try to control um, the spread of that over time while the, those guys are in their tanks. And the maintenance for that is just to change out your bulbs once a year. Okay, this is one of my favorite uh, pieces of equipment. We actually just got one in for one of our last resident tanks that do doesn't have one, so it's pretty exciting. This is your protein skimmer or protein fractionator. Those are interchangeable words. Um, this removes dissolved organic compounds in particular. So basically what it does is it pulls water in from the tank and it injects air from the bottom of the skimmer and it allows these bubbles to come up. Well, as the bubbles are arising, it actually um, creates this wet sticky surface for the dissolved compounds or proteins to stick to. The foam will rise up and push all of that nasty protein and waste out of your system and down the drain. Um, this helps create um, better clarity in your tanks as well as maintaining pH too. And this is a chemical and mechanical type of filtration. So, this is quite a loud video, but you can see here on the right all the bubbles that are foaming up at the top. This is running 24 seven, so it's constantly pulling waste out. And it's really interesting to see uh, comparatively when you, um, after you feed the, the turtles in the morning and the fish, all of that protein will get kind of nasty color, uh, like a grayish green, and it'll be pushed up and out of the system. And then versus the end of the day, it's not as, as dark colored. So that's, I think, pretty interesting. Here on the left, it is more of like a diagram of exactly what we were talking about. It pulls in the water through the bottom and then also through the side, air is pushed in to help create those bubbles going up. And the RK2s work through a chemical process called absorption. It also can help stabilize pH levels in your closed systems over time, which is also super important to aquatic life. So those are pretty helpful. Okay, so this is our hospital side. We have nine tanks total. Um, you can't see all of them, but I did my best with the picture. Um, we do have sand filters, pumps associated with each filter, heat exchangers, chlorinators. Um, they all share one heater chiller. And we'll go over that in a bit and one freshwater bat as well. So over here, we have a lovely patient. I believe that is um, Popsicle is his name. He's pretty cute. <laughs> and this is one of our FP tanks. So we actually have two. Each tank is considered a closed system. So we are able to house FP turtles in their own tanks and it won't, we don't have to worry about the water from that tank going into the non-FP related turtles. So that is really great. Over here is just a picture of some of our filtration. We do have quite a few since we have a lot of tanks. Um, each tank has their own sand filter. They're numbered here. And then number one, tank number one actually is the FP tank. So we have a UV sterilizer on that. And then we also have heat exchangers here and the pumps associated with each sand filter. So we actually source our water. We're very lucky with that because some places don't have the capability of doing that and they have to make their own salt water, which can be very, very expensive. But it also, if you're making your own salt water, it also helps um, knowing that you don't have any bacteria or uh, other viruses like in your water at all. Um, so what that means for us is that one, we are lucky because we don't have to pay for our water, but we do have to treat our water. So we have the lagoon here right behind our uh, hospital and we were able to pull that into our silos. So over here on the right, I don't believe I added the second silo, but this is the main silo that we pull water into. So we have over here on the left, we have the lagoon, these lines where this little bird is sitting, uh, they congregate on top of our intake valves, um, but our intakes go directly into our pumps here. The pumps are able to pull the water into our sand filter. It gets filtered through and then pushes it to the actual silo to fill. And then once it is filled, it starts cycling into these things that I like to call minions. They're definitely not called that, <laughs> but they're cute and short and yellow. So they look like a minion, but they're just canister filters. And essentially it's just cycling that water through to have another form of filtration. 
So it will get any other gunk that's built up from the lagoon out. We also hyperchlorinate our water. So that way we can kill off any bacteria that's living in it or other uh, types of algae, stuff like that. So this will circulate for 24 hours. And then I can actually transfer water over to the other silo that we have. That way we have more water working at a time. So this is a lot going on here, <laughs> but this is how we heat our tanks. So over here, uh, we'll start, this is for one of our silos for heating that. We have a sand filter associated to it and the pump with it. So from the silo, the water is being pulled into the pump and into the filter. It's being constantly filtered 24 seven, just like our tanks, and then returning back to the silo. But before it goes back in, it actually returns from the multi-port. This is a different type of multi-port. It's not as um, multifunctional as the other ones that I showed you, but it does the, it does the job. Um, so it's actually able to return the water to our heater chiller, whatever setting I have it to right now, it's, it's chilling because it's pretty warm here, which I'm sure it's warm there as well. Um, it will chill the water to whatever temperature we have it set to, and then it'll go back into the silo and continue to recirculate. For our actual tanks that we have on the hospital side, we have these things called heater, uh, heat exchangers, which are right here. They're very small, but they do quite a good job of heating our tanks. So we have a fresh water vat and another heater chiller right here. So the water from the fresh water vat um, is being pumped by this little, or being pulled from this little pump down here. It's then pushed into our heater chiller, which then goes to our heat exchangers right here, which is along every single um, piece of filtration for each tank. Inside of the heat exchangers, there are coils and fresh water works best with these coils. That way it doesn't corrode them over time. So it's helping heat those coils up. And inside of them is actually the water, um, or excuse me, the water inside below the coils is actually from the tank. So it's heating, the fresh water is heating those coils, which is in return heating the water inside of that heat exchanger and it's being pushed back out into the pool. That way it's having warmer water or cooler water depending on the season. So for our resident side, we have five tanks total. Um, over on the hospital side, our tanks range from 300 gallons up to 3,000 gallons. So not a whole lot of water uh, to work with, which is good. Um, but on the other side, we have them ranging from 18,000 gallons all the way up to 56,000 gallons. So quite a lot of water to work with, which means that there's more filtration involved. So we have uh, more sand filters, pumps, chlorinators, heater chillers, and uh, protein skimmers on this side. So this is just um, one tank. This is our largest tank. It actually has three sand filters. It's kind of hard to see the other one. It's back over here. This system, we only have three sand filters on it right now. In the future, it could be better or beneficial to have more on there just because it is such a large amount of water. But we do have quite a great RK2 protein skimmer um, system on it as well. So that is pretty great. So in the middle here is the protein skimmer and on the side we have biological filters. So it just helps, it's essentially like other sand filters. So it does help over time. So the way that we source and heat our water is basically the same as our hospital side. It's just on a larger scale. So we have, um, oh, excuse me, let me go back. We have much larger silos over here. Each of them contain close to 20,000 gallons, which is really good because I do water changes on all of our tanks once a week. And like I said, there's quite a bit of water over here. So uh, we source our water from that same lagoon. It gets pulled into these silos. We hyperchlorinate it, let it run for 24 hours. We will dechlorinate it before we use it, backwash our system so it gets all the gunk out and then it, the water is ready to use. So over on this side, we don't have heat exchangers only because these tanks are much larger. So we actually have heater chillers for each of the tanks um, on their own. So there's no fresh water vat on this side as of yet, um, but it strictly just runs on the heater chiller. So the water that is being returned from the sand filter is going back into that heater chiller and returned to the pool. 
And tank A, uh, which is our largest tank, the 56,000 gallon actually has two heater chillers on it just because of how large it is. Okay, so uh, we'll touch on our Holt Stun event here. Uh, that was back in February, which somehow feels like yesterday and uh, also a million years ago. <laughs> it went by uh, kind of in the blink of an eye. It was only a, a week long, but it was uh, an intense week for sure, um, as <laughs> Dr. Bonka could definitely uh, attest to. So uh, the sea turtles get their body heat from, from the water and the sun. And anytime that the water is below 10 degrees Celsius, basically it causes them to go into this shock-like state. Since they get their body heat from the sun and the water, when they're in that cold of water, they just simply can't move. They can barely come up to breathe. And a lot of times they get stranded. So they'll wash up on shore. Um, and we were very, very fortunate enough to have lots of volunteers, lots of people from our community and, um, just everyone basically helping us out. We came in at over 5,000 sea turtles, which that number still blows our mind to this day. It was definitely the largest cold sun event to happen um, in history, especially in that short amount of time. Um, it was so many turtles, but thankfully we were able to stay organized and, and try to help each other out as much as possible. And we were able to get um, so many back home and that was such a good feeling. However, during this event, uh, not only did all of this happen to the turtles, but um, our facility wasn't nearly as prepared as we thought we were. So some of the problems that we unfortunately faced during this cold stun week was we were without power for almost 72 hours. So obviously if we don't have power, there's no way we can heat our tanks at all. So unfortunately we had to remove all of our resident sea turtles. So we have five total in those very large tanks. There's not a super easy way to get them out. Uh, luckily we have uh, an okay system to do that, but uh, we don't usually need to. So getting them out was quite a challenge. These guys range from anywhere it's from 80 pounds to 200 pounds. So they're quite large and it takes quite a lot of people to get them out. Um, sea turtles can stay out of the water for up to a week without causing harm. Um, but these guys, since there are resident sea turtles, they stay in their tanks all the time. So uh, being out of the water isn't really an option for them and very, very rare to happen unless we need to do like a blood draw or work up on them for uh, medical reasons. Um, and then keeping our hospital tanks warm enough was very scary too, because we didn't have power for that long of time. Uh, all of our tanks were covered. Uh, we are outdoors, so uh, we didn't have anything blocking wind. And it, because it was so cold, uh, I believe the coldest day was like 20 something degrees. So it was quite challenging. We do have a small propane tank that we can change our heater chiller to our propane heater. And that did help quite a bit, um, but it was still pretty pretty uh, intense to, to worry about all of that on top of how many turtles we had to. Uh, we also have fish in our tanks on our resident side, and that's really to create a natural environment for our resident sea turtles. They are the ones that can't be released. So we wanna create this really good environment that would um, feel like a natural environment to them. Um, so there wasn't any aeration for the fish. Fortunate enough, uh, a lot of them made it, which was really good. Um, I don't really know how because <laughs> they're not extremely hardy fish, but we love them and we are very thankful that they're still here as well. And we also did not have running water. So we did face quite a few problems um, and that's okay because we were able to learn so many things from this event too. So we definitely learned that we need some kind of backup generator, especially if we lose power again, whether it's a winter storm or just something that's being worked on um, outside of our control. We definitely need to have generators to either chill or heat our water at any time that we, we don't have to pull any of our residents or our patients out or simply just worry about them. We wanna make sure that we're giving them the best care. Uh, we do need more efficient heater chillers that are actually aquarium grade. Right now we're using ones that are more spa and pool related, which they do a, a fairly okay job. But when it comes to the winter time, um, we do need some kind of supplemental heating help, uh, help helping out uh, for those systems since they do run from um, basically 50 degrees below, Fahrenheit below, uh, they don't work as well. So 
any kind of supplemental feeding will be beneficial in the future as well. And then enclosing our hospital side to keep wind and debris out, especially during colder periods. So we did learn quite a bit about what we can do moving forward, which is very great. On both sides, we would love to have generators. And on our hospital side here in the next few months, we're hopefully going to be uh, breaking ground and starting construction. So hopefully you'll see that in the future too. And we are looking at enclosing our hospital, which is going to be wonderful. It's going to help on so many different levels, especially keeping heat and uh, cooling into our tanks. And then we're also looking at a new grid-like plumbing system instead of uh, what we have now. Unfortunately, it's kind of like a spaghetti structure in this moment just because of time constraints or anything like that back in, in the past. Um, the pipes are kind of all over the place and they're not really easy to access, especially if anything happens. Um, I have to crawl up underneath all kinds of things right now. So we would love to implement this grid system in the flooring. That way we can lift up a grate and then access the plumbing right away. Um, that'll be super, super helpful. Um, and that is something we were thinking maybe you guys could help us with or we can talk about too. But okay, do you guys have any questions? Hey guys, uh, don't be shy. <laughs> Uh, have you tried solar heaters or water? Oh, I'm sorry. Have you tried? Have we tried solar heaters or anything like that? Oh, water? no, I don't. I don't think so. But mm. I can write things down. Because <laughs> even in the winter, it does get cold, but oftentimes we will still have sun, which could be beneficial for yeah, that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and you can save a lot of money. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. always good for a nonprofit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was gonna try to uh, ask about that. Uh, how, as a nonprofit, how do you get the uh, sufficient funds for your projects and to keep, you know, things working? Good question. So we run almost exclusively on donations. Um, so we have a combination of annual donors. We have people that. Um, donate kind of on a one-off. We have Amazon wish list for a lot of the items that we use on a regular basis. Um, and in fact, a lot of the chemicals and things like that that Maria uses are on an Amazon wish list so that people can help out. You know, maybe they don't want to send a check or can or something like that, but they are able or interested in purchasing something for us in that manner. Um, and then also because we're open to the public, a lot of our money comes from that um, entrance. So we do charge a fee for entrance to come into um, our facilities. And so that actually provides a lot of the income that we use for our day-to-day -day operations. Um, following up on that, um, do you get any aid from the government or, or is there any fund created by the government that helps these type of organizations? Sure, so we periodically apply for multiple different grants. Um, in fact, I'm currently working on several different grant applications. And so we are able to do some of that. Um, you guys are probably familiar with the BP oil spill that happened in 2010. Um, we are currently receiving funds um, as repayment from that. There was a large amount of money that came from that that's distributed um, on an annual basis through different, there's kind of different, um, we call them buckets, but it's basically kind of different pipelines of funds where that money goes into and projects that it helps. And we're one of the receiving organizations for that. Um, however, that does have a cap. So eventually that money's going to run out and we're going to need to find other sources as well. So um, all of us, it's kind of a, we're a very small organization. Uh, we have about 20 or so full, full and part-time employees and then several hundred volunteers. And so within um, the full and part-time employees, all of us also work on either finding grants, looking for grants, or helping out with ideas and things like that to try and, you know, find income sources for us. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Who else has some question? I, I have one question. Now that we're in the topic of uh, like government and stuff, you guys, like when you use a silo, is there like a regulation to use the water from the lagoon or something like that? Or can you just grab all the water that you want and please? Yeah, that is a really good question. Uh, to my knowledge, we have the right to do that. And we can also ask, um, the, the city uh, based on their like water quality to make sure that it is safe for us to use as well. Um, but other than that, I'm not sure. I know 
much more about that. So the land that we're, the area of the Laguna that we're pulling water from, um, it is, I think, technically on our property because we own quite a bit of the property that surrounds where our actual building is. And so we do, uh, we are able to pull some of that, but like Maria mentioned, we're also hooked into city water. And so we receive some of that as well. Okay. And uh, one follow-up question on that. You guys like test the water for pH levels and stuff like that when you grab it for the, for the silos? Yep, sure do. I totally forgot to mention that. Um, being an Aquarius, that's like one of my favorite things to do is water quality. So I'm constantly checking the, the temperature, the pH of it, um, the salinity. And that's that's basically it on a day-to-day -day basis, at least for our, pa our patient side, our hospital side. Um, on the other side, I'm constantly looking at ammonia levels, like I said, but also the alkalinity levels and, and general hardness and stuff like that too. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, one last question. Um, are you actually the cooler Maria? <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, yeah, great question. That was my maiden name. So um, I guess I used to be. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank <Thanks>. you. <laughs> um, I also wanted to ask, um, I don't know if you mentioned it, but what's your heat source for your heat exchangers? So the heat comes from, we have the freshwater vat and the heater chiller that's attached to it. So when the freshwater is going through the heater chiller, if it's on heat, it's getting heated and then it goes through the heat exchangers, which have the coils inside, which again, like adds additional heat to the salt water that's coming through them as well. Okay, so yeah. maybe you could use a steam heat exchangers for... Steam heat exchanger, okay. Because you mentioned you sometimes you have problems heating the water when it gets very, very cold, right? Yeah, absolutely. Very cool, thank you. You can look into that for sure. Um, there's also, let me see. Um, there was a couple of questions. Um, some uh, some people raise their hand, their hands. Uh, okay. Um, nobody else. I I do have Christian. Okay. Um, I raised my hand. I just I just was waiting for like. Uh, uh, like I might go ahead. I didn't want to interrupt anyone. But um, do you guys have any other future projects that you are working on? Like other than this project, what are other projects that you would like to um, uh, develop or do in the future? Yeah, so at least to what I'm thinking, um, other than our hospital renovations, um, also adding a freshwater vat onto our resident side, um, only because we don't have any way to access fresh water right now that's dechlorinated to add to our tanks. So with the lagoon, it is a wonderful source of water and it's, it's free, which is wonderful. However, there's no way for me right now to um, regulate the salinity levels. So during the summertime, the salinity increases because it's a very warm. Um, so sometimes our salinity can be at 45 ppt, which is uh, very, very high. Um, usually, and with regulation, we want our uh, levels to be around 35. So that's a 10 ppt difference. So um, fresh water vat would be very, very helpful in, in order for us to actually maintain that level um, and for safe levels for our fish and our sea turtles. I got another follow-up question, just really quick. Have you guys considered using biofilters or any such sort of device? And I like um, anything that could uh, filter water using biological means, such as bacteria, algae, uh, maybe plants. Yeah, um, honest, oh, someone turned the light off on us. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I haven't looked into that only because we have kind of limited space uh, right now, but that could be very interesting to look into for the future, for sure. 
another thing that we're interested in implementing, it's not necessarily life support directly, but um, we're really interested in trying to find some type of rainwater capture method. So we do get a decent amount of rain periodically, and right now we don't have any way to capture that, and we would like to capture it to then either be able to use it for things like um, we're looking at implementing an employee garden, as well as irrigation for landscaping, and then even potentially using it as a backup freshwater source um, in kind of an emergency situation. Real nice, thank you. <laughs> um, Roberto? Uh, yes, I came to ask uh, some questions. Uh, the first one is, what are the youngest age in which you pick up the code? The, the turtles because I think the majority of the pictures that you pick like other turtles or the other ones, but I never seen the you pick like the younger ones because they are the ones that are in the most danger of being caught by every kind of predator. Mm -hmm. So during nesting season, like uh, nesting season has officially started, we don't, haven't had anything nest yet. Uh, but during nesting season, we actually move nests. So we move all the eggs to a protected area. And so when they hatch, we actually collect the little hatchlings off the surface of the nest. Um, we take some measurements, but then we drive them down the beach to an area that's kind of protected, release them so then they can enter the water. Um, and then as far as our hospital side goes, we get in patients for ranging in size from kind of a smaller post hatchling that occasionally washes back with a storm all the way up through adults. But our primary, uh, I would say our primary patient is about 30, 40 centimeters in carapace length, kind of that juvenile, uh, because they utilize the Laguna habitat around here for feeding. We get a lot of green sea turtles in. Okay, thank you. Just one final question. Uh, is there any other way in which we can help your organization? Uh, for example, I, I don't know, maybe small donations of $10 or something? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, so we, you know, that's, that's kind of what we run on, right, is any type of donation, any, anything from, you know, $1 all the way through hundreds, but also time, um, potential ideas, like we we're talking about with Maria, like you guys have suggested ways to either improve what we have, build upon what we have, um, designing or helping design projects that may facilitate either um, a better setup that helps Maria as well as you know anything else but yes and if you're interested in mo donating monetarily um, you can go to our website it's seaturtleinc.org and there'll be a button at the top um, but yeah we're definitely looking for anything like that but also collaborations um, mm -hmm. to help us out with like I mentioned our our life support systems yeah. <laughs> well thanks a lot yeah thank thanks. you <laughs> I think there is also Irma or somebody else raised their hand. I raised my hand, but I don't know if you can hear me well. Yes, we can. Okay, it's just I have to put a mask on. So I had a question about the sand filters. Okay. And could you show the diagram, please? Yeah, let me share my screen again. Just that my question is about how do you get the um, the trash out? Okay, yeah. I mean, because I understood that you put water into that, and so the water gets clean. But then, how do you how do you clean the sand? Right. Okay. So the way that we can do that is through changing our multi port valve, and basically. When we do that, we can put it onto the backwashing setting and it stirs up the sand. So the water is still incoming through the same line, but it's going a different way into the actual sand, fluffing it up. And so all of that uh, gunk and trash, like you're saying, is getting picked up and it's being able to be pushed out into the waistline. Um, I'm not sure that you can see my, there it is, okay. Yeah, I can. Um, the waistline is this extra line down here. So um, instead of returning it back to the pool, the multi-port kind of stops. It has a valve right here. It's stuck or not a valve, um, like, a, like a barrier. And it can block going back to the pool and instead it'll go into the waistline and, and do it that way. So that way it gets rid of all of that. And where does our wastewater mm -hmm. go? The wastewater uh, goes back into um, 
back behind our silo area, which is where uh, like the marsh is. So it's going back into the environment and really there's nothing bad in the, the water. It's just getting all of that gunk back out of our systems. So it's not doing any harm when it goes back out into the environment or anything like that. I have a question. Um, have you tried injecting air to the sand? It's because if you inject air, you can actually make it like water. And I don't know if the gunk is like solid or has mm -hmm. a specific density, it can go out without having to waste water. But I don't know if you have the these um, filters, like you already purchased them like that, or you can modify them. Yeah, so um, in another way to kind of like maintenance it um, is by taking off the lid, like having all the system completely off and no water going into your sand filter. And to kind of make sure that that sand doesn't get compact over time, if that's what you're saying, like you can actually create some kind of like piping system to probe into the sand with fresh water that's dechlorinated. That way you're not killing off any of that uh, beneficial bacteria um, and kind of like poke your way around it to fluff the sand up more. And that helps get extra gunk that might be settled down uh, from over, over the years, however old your, your sand filter is. Even newer ones, it's a really good way to do that too. That was all, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thank you guys. Okay, if there's no other question, uh, okay. Because I've seen the carbon activated filters mm -hmm. in, and I wanted to ask you because doesn't that affect your salinity levels because that takes down the PPMs to a very low standard, right? Um, honestly, I'm not sure. Uh, I worked with them just for a short period of time, the carbon filters, and I, I think I'd mentioned uh, we don't have any on our systems right now, um, but I can definitely look into that. That would be interesting. I know it definitely helps with uh, extra waste and stuff like that from the fish, so I, I definitely look into that. Thank you. I thought I heard you had ones, so that's why. I yeah, we, we only have two on this side, and they're currently not being used. I would love to implement them on the other side, especially since we have uh, more waste in those systems, since we do have bigger turtles and, and lots of fish in there. Um, so that's my fault. I should have explained that. Okay. Oh, thank you. Uh, anybody else? It's it's a hard audience. They're making <laughs> good questions. I like uh, it. Yes. Uh, so um, the the students they prepare a, a few questions in advance. So I, I I will read some of them that I think they are interesting. Uh, for example, some people ask if. Does ocean pollution uh, affect the nesting and migrating patterns of sea turtles? How does this affect their growth and when hatch? Really good question. Very good. Um, so it's a hard question too. So sea turtles, tip, depending on the species, will come back to nest every year, every few years, things like that. I'm going to speak to the Kemp's Ridley because that's what we have the most of here, um, and that's what I've worked with the most. So they come back about every year and a half or so. And one of the things that we've noticed is that nesting numbers for a long time were exponentially growing up until about 2010. And so it coincided with the BP oil spill. Um, and since 2010, we've seen this kind of um, fluctuating pattern, this cyclical pattern of high numbers and then lower numbers. And we're not really sure what's going on with the population, but one of the hypotheses is that there's less food out there to support them. So they may be extending their nesting interval and that in part could be due to ocean pollution. Um, that could be in part due to the buildup of plastics and other pollutions, which then in turn is affecting crabs and fish. And in the Kemp's Ridley, they really love blue crabs. That's also a popular fishery. And so it's, it's we're not sure to answer that question, but it's definitely interesting. And it's something that a lot of people are, are looking at. And it's definitely, plastics are affecting the hatchlings as well. Um, and so, the, especially the small plastics, they get washed into um, those convergent zones where you have 
uh, different tides or different currents coming together. And in those areas, you have really high numbers of sargassum, which is that kind of floating um, seaweed, which is perfect for post hatchlings. They can hide there. There's also a lot of stuff to feed on. And so that's where they spend a lot of time growing, but that's also where a lot of trash goes. And turtles, they'll bite at basically anything, especially at that size. And so they will also ingest a lot of plastics. So we will find, um, especially on turtles that get necropsied, that wash up, stranded, dead, things like that, that they often will have a lot of plastic in their gut. And so we're not 100% what, what those ramifications are going forward, but plastics are definitely affecting our sea turtles on a lot of different levels. Okay, yeah, thank you. Uh, okay, there's another question. Um, how resistant are the shells of the turtles? Ooh, that's also a good question. Um, so I think that there probably have been some studies looking at the specifics of that. I'm not as familiar with them. Um, I know that when it comes, and Maria can speak to this because she also works in the rehab department. Um, I know that when it comes to things like boat strikes, uh, the propellers will very easily cut through those shells. Um, they're more resistant when it comes to jetties. Um, you can talk a little bit about that from rehab. Yeah, I mean, um, sometimes I think it just depends on the individual too, and probably as they're older, you know, they they have more growth to their their carapace, so it could potentially be harder uh, versus when they're younger. Um, I personally don't know, but that would be my guess. Um, but it is quite interesting to see propeller wounds. Um, it's very unfortunate. Some of them can be just on the surface or it can go directly down past their spine if they're unfortunate enough. Um, but we actually have a patient right now uh, named Wolverine because it literally looks like he was scratched by Wolverine, uh, but they're both propellers. And um, yeah, uh, part of his lung is exposed and it can put them in a very critical state. What's really cool though, is that sea turtles are very resilient. So even though they have a very, um, or a semi strong carapace uh, to protect them, you know, this metal object that, you know, it's gonna do a lot of damage to them, but uh, he's doing really well. So hopefully he'll get to be released within the next few months. So that's pretty cool. Okay, uh, so somebody asked if, if they are near South Padre Island, and I'm witness of a threat against sea turtles. Should I contact you? Absolutely. Um, so we have a stranding number that is monitored 24 seven. Um, and we also have our standard, um, like our standard business phone number, but we do have a phone that's monitored 24 seven for anything like that. And so we respond to any type of stranding, injury, nesting, basically anything that involves sea turtles, we respond to it. Okay, um, there's one question that states, um, uh, what type of technology are going to be implemented on the new rehab center? Question. You <laughs> Very can talk good about, question. about the life support part. Um, I mean, I think for the most part, we're pretty much keeping the same types of uh, filtration and everything like that. What would be cool are um, some other systems that they're called like ORP HANA systems. And a lot of that, a lot of the times they have alarms set to them. So if for any reason uh, the temperatures drop or the pH drops within our range or even salinity, it can detect that. And that's pretty cool. And so from even a remote location, if say I was on vacation or something like that, I can call up my boss or my coworker and be like, hey, we need to go monitor tank number such and such or all of the tanks or even the silo. And um, yeah, that, those things are pretty cool. So maybe we can look into getting something like that um, as far as life support goes. Um, those, are, those are pretty cool. From an operating standpoint, we're looking at increasing to include a CT scan machine um, just to scan our turtles on site. Uh, that helps a lot to understand some of their internal injuries. And right now we can do that on occasion. Uh, there's a local person about an hour and a half away or so that will do CT scans for us um, on occasion, but it would be really nice to have one on site so that we can actually address our turtles as they come in. Um, and that also is useful for looking at internal tumors. Um, if they have internal tumors, that's a whole other set 
Um, and often in that case, we have to euthanize, but we don't always know that. And so that would help with that. We're also looking, like I mentioned, about include increasing kind of our green footprint. Um, so, you know, conservation is one leg of our mission. And so we want to implement that so that we are doing what we're talking about. And yeah. so that includes, we're looking, like I mentioned, at that rainwater system, but also other ways to make our building more energy efficient. And then from a research standpoint, we're looking at including um, things like um, UAV, so like drones, um, as well as some Bluetooth temperature loggers and things like that to look at nesting and turtle movements and things like that. Okay, um, thank you. There are some people that ask about the two things. Uh, how did you deal with features that captured turtles and what could be the forecast for the next 10 years? Ooh, good questions. I like them. <laughs> um, so yeah, we work pretty closely with the community. Um, and so a lot of the community, especially after this cold sun event, when everyone so we've always known there's a lot of turtles out here, but it was more of a, yeah, there's turtles, not much more than that. But after this cold sun with how many, with thousands of them coming in, um, everyone really saw how many are actually out in our waters. And we have a big, um, there's a big fishing community here. So a lot of people come on vacation, obviously to South Padre, but when they get here, they like to go on boat tours, charter tours, fishing tours, things like that. And so in fact, a lot of our boat captains were some of the people that were responding in those first few days and bringing us um, hundreds of turtles. And so now when they go out, they look for turtles and they know they're around and they slow down their speed mm -hmm. and they do things like that. And so that's helping decrease some of those interactions. Uh, we also have SpaceX that's over on Boca Chica and their employees are now all very aware of how many sea turtles are around and they're very um, excited to help out with turtles and spread the message of keeping their eyes out for them, especially in nesting season. So we're working towards um, getting across the message of the fact that Kemp's Ridley's nest in the daytime. And these beaches are very popular, especially on weekends for families to come out, enjoy the beach, go fishing and things like that. But you can drive on our beaches. Um, and so we're working on getting out the message of driving slower to look out for turtles. Um, they blend in as soon as they come out of that water, they, dry off because it's very warm and they blend in very, very well with the sand. So we're working on getting that out to help decrease those interactions as well. And then next 10 years, I would like to think <laughs> that in the next 10 years, we're going to see an increase in all of our turtle populations and we're going to see a lot more people that are actively implementing different conservation methods in their day to day life. And I think we're starting to see some of that with that push of less plastic use and reusable use. And I think that's starting to get a lot of mainstream traction. And I think that that is really, really encouraging. Like I saw the other day, a commercial for toilet paper that talked about how they plant three trees for every one that they use. And I think that if that's the kind of commercials we're starting to see, I'm hoping that that gets more traction mm -hmm. and that that's what we can see in 10 years. And we can see that in the number of turtles that are nesting. Yeah, for sure. And if that, you know, the reusable lifestyle becomes more of a social norm, it's not going to be such a hard thing to, you know, help. <laughs> so, yeah. Cool. Okay. Uh, somebody else uh, wants to make a question or make a, a comment? What do you guys think it's going to look like in 10 years? Um, I have a question regarding that also. Uh, you know, there was this big campaign, I don't know if in the USA also, but here in Mexico, about getting rid of straws because they were very harmful of the turtles. I'm, I mean, it started kind of like a meme, but, you know, it's true. So what other things or plastic or waste are are more most like affecting the, the turtles than, that can be removed in the near future? This is one of Maria's favorite questions. Love it. She was a big <laughs> part of a get rid of the straw campaign. Yeah, so um, I like to think that I, uh, you know, I help the planet and in every way that I can, especially like at a young age, I tried to help uh, my family start recycling and stuff like that. Um, that wasn't like a big topic back when I was growing up. Um, but as I got older and in high school, I started learning more about like plastic bags are really harmful to the environment, not just marine life, but terrestrial life too. They can get stuck in trees and hurt birds and like it's just really bad in general. So I stopped, we stopped as a family 
using plastic bags. And um, unfortunately, you see a lot of uh, turtles eating plastic bags or potentially eating plastic bags. Sorry, my computer is about to die. I'm just going back. But um, uh, Amy, uh, Dr. Branca was saying that, you know, the, especially the hatchlings are eating and consuming all this plastic out there. They're, they're excited to find food. Um, maybe because it's scarce in that area, but also, you know, they're not taking the time or the consideration of what they're eating per se, because it's available and they're just eating. So if it's plastic, they're going to eat. Um, but I kind of got sidetracked there. Um, back in 2017, I did an internship um, rehabilitating sea turtles, and that pretty much changed my whole life. That made me, you know, want to do what I'm doing today. Um, but I also learned about skipping the straw. Um, and I had never thought about that. I had thought about recycling in plastic bags for years and years, but I was like, oh my gosh, all of a sudden this straw is this huge deal. Like think about how many straws I've used over just my life and everybody using a straw too. So there is a statistic that's still unfortunately about the same number, but in the US alone, every single day, 500 million straws are used. And that's only one day. So think about the huge impact it is to just skip one straw if you decide that you are not going to use a straw, you're making a huge difference. And if you start to continue that and implement that in the rest of your life, that's impacting a lot of animals, not just sea turtles. Um, and then, of course, if you're implementing other changes like reducing your plastic bag you know, intake or um, using less water bottles that are single use items and using a reusable one instead, those are huge differences um, in the long run. And making sure that you're recycling properly, that is also a huge thing too. So in every area, especially in the US and each state, each city, each county has a different recycling protocol. And it's really important to know that what you can recycle and what you can't, because if you're putting in items that it's kind of like a wishful thinking that you're like, oh, well, this is made out of plastic. I can throw that in and I can throw that in. It actually clogs up the machine and makes it harder for the people that work there. And potentially the recycling that you have spent all this time doing um, is actually thrown away. So those are um, really important things to think about. What do you think is going to be the next, like, skip the straw thing? Mm, that's a good, I think like styrofoam, hopefully, and like plastic cutlery. I think that is pretty, pretty bad. So hopefully people will stop, especially with people that have um, like large gatherings. And I know, you know, COVID has kind of um, changed that a bit, but like parties and stuff, people tend to not think about using actual like dinerware. Instead, they buy styrofoam plates or, uh, you know, paper plates and stuff like that. And over time, that really adds up, especially um, when it can't actually be recycled. So. What do you think is going to be the next kind of big movement by you? Any opinion, guys? Uh, I mean, me or, or, yeah. or everyone? Because I made a question. No, because um, I don't know. So I, I'm thinking about if the well, here in Mexico is, is rare, then they give you a straw anymore. They don't actually give you straws. But they, some businesses... Uh, offer alternatives such as biodegradable straws or even whole sets of of what they used to give like plastic uh, cutlery or yeah. or bags uh, do, do that does that really help or does biodegradable plastic biodegradable plastic uh, plastic uh, that better or it's just like yeah, I think it's like you know it's a better alternative I mean to me if you can avoid using those two, that would be cool, but um, they are biodegradable. So over time they will break down and you don't have to worry about it harming things as much, but I still think that that kind of is an issue. Um, I don't know, what do you think about that? Yeah. I think Leonardo? if they're, yeah, I think if they're disposed of properly. Yeah. Leonardo, but, you have a question? Sorry. Yes, teacher. Uh, I want to ask if you guys have seen um, any effects of COVID-19, like mask clothing on water or um, reduction on fishing activities? Have you seen more masks on your beach? Please? More masks? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, even, even from the very beginning of the pandemic, I would always go out to wherever I was. Um, I used to live in Florida, but then I, I went back in uh, July of last year up to New Jersey, and it really didn't matter where I was. There were masks littered everywhere. 
um, masks and gloves and more plastic bags because people didn't want to touch things. So I would, I would, I don't know about you, but I saw people like wrapping their hands in plastic bags, like even Ziploc bags. Um, to me, that felt extreme, even though I was taking the pandemic seriously, but I was like, oh my gosh, this is a lot of personal PPE that could be used at hospitals or at our hospital um, that's being used. And, and I know, you know, COVID was, it, it still is very, um, important to take seriously, but uh, disposing of your items is also very important to make sure that they don't harm anyone else. But a lot of times I feel like, unfortunately, people just think about themselves and not the impacts that they'll have. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay, so I think it's time to wrap up. Uh, I'm very happy that we can actually make this happen, uh, hopefully. Next time we can actually make the trip there. Um, that will be awesome. Maybe yeah. in the pandemic. Um, so I, I'm taking the chance of inviting myself. Uh, Absolutely, then, you are welcome, welcome. anytime. <laughs> yes, and, and probably um, it will be nice if um, we can actually make uh, some other type of collaboration, including um, helping helping you in some engineering or helping uh, getting some funding. So um, I'm looking forward for, for that type of um, more, um, uh, like as a next step. Um, so I will ask uh, the students if they can turn on their cameras just to make like, a, uh, let's say a snapshot for uh, the, the visit. So it will be nice to have it. Uh, for everybody. Sounds good. Okay. So there are a few, they are very shy. They don't like cameras, <laughs> you know, the- Always happens. <laughs> How is the young people? Okay. <laughs> okay. So thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and sorry for the inconvenience of uh, the email the last time I, that's um, some issues with the kettles, but um, thank you very oh, much. No, that's I, totally ours. I changed the time the wrong direction, so I apologize. That was my fault. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, don't worry. Um, the other way around. Thank you very much, and hope you see you soon. Absolutely. Thank, thank you, you, guys. Thanks for the Appreciate opportunity. It. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Aww. Thank you. Thank you guys. Ok, chicos, este, pues ya son las prácticamente las cinco y media. Eh, ay, déjenme quito esto de aquí. Entonces, eh, bueno, pues con eso terminaríamos la, eh, la sesión del día de hoy. Este, espero que eh, pues les haya gustado. Este, digo, está abierta ahí la posibilidad de hacer alguna especie de proyecto con que les pudiera llegar a, a servir a ellos. Este, todavía tenemos tiempo para, para definirlo. Eh, de entrada, bueno, yo creo que, eh, digo, más allá de lo que pudieron ustedes aprender de los artículos, pues siempre, eh, pues hablar con los que están metidos en los problemas del día a día es, es muy valioso. Eh, gracias por conectarse y bueno, pues nos vemos el siguiente martes. Eh, 